I find that the interests of justice require that there be a second trial in the case of people versus power. A new trial is ordered in the Rodney King beating. Are federal charges a sure thing? Today, we'll ask the Attorney General of the United States, William Barr, and we'll talk about the Bush administration's reaction to the riots with a congresswoman whose district was hardest hit, Maxine Waters, with urban economist Jeff Fold, and Republican political consultant Ed Rollins. No justice! No peace! The law in Los Angeles, an issue facing the nation. Face the Nation with Chief Washington Correspondent Bob Schieffer. And now from CBS News in Washington, Bob Schieffer. It has been nearly three weeks now since the Rodney King verdict, and we're pleased this morning to have the first interview since then with the Attorney General of the United States, William Barr. Mr. Barr, thank you for coming. Uh, how close are you to deciding whether or not you are going to bring uh, federal charges, or at least seek federal charges, against the officers who were acquitted uh, by the state jury? Well, Bob, <clears throat> as you know, we have a pending grand jury investigation of that case. And under the law, I'm limited as to what I can say about it. Obviously, anything I could say could jeopardize and undercut any potential future action we take. Uh, we have a crackerjack team of prosecutors working on the case. They are going full bore. Uh, we know there is a strong public interest in, in moving quickly. Uh, at the same time, uh, it's important that we fully develop the facts of this case and fully build a case. I think the last uh, thing the American people would want is for us to precipitously rush to indictments uh, and then uh, not be able to win that case in court. And so we have to use the grand jury process to build a case. Well, well can I just, I, I understand what you're saying, but can you give me some sort of a timetable? I mean, surely your prosecutors know or your investigators know how close they are to saying, uh, Mr. Attorney General, we're ready to go with this thing or we're, we're not ready to go with it. Uh, I really can't give you a specific timetable. In fact, uh, the timetable is constantly being revised as we find out more about uh, the case, more about potential witnesses, and areas that we want to pin down. Uh, I uh, did get uh, a rough estimate last week, but it's subject to change. I'm talking to the prosecutors uh, next week to get a revised assessment. We're moving quickly, uh, but we have to do the job professionally. We have to do it right. Uh, this week, the uh, state judge did decide to go ahead and retry Lawrence Powell. Uh, whose case was the one that ended in a hung jury. Now, when the state began its uh, process on all four of the officers, you suspended the federal investigation because you said that was proper while the state moved in. Does this now mean that you will suspend the investigation again, or will this have any effect on the, on the timetable or, or, or the process of your own investigators now? No, the, the, uh, the, state, uh, the new state trial of Officer Powell will not affect our investigation or our timetable uh, for making a determination as to whether uh, there will be indictments. Is there a possibility that you might seek any charges against any other officers other than those four? All I would say about that, Bob, is that we're looking at the whole incident from ground zero forward. We, we are not limiting ourselves to any particular set of people. So there is a possibility there could be more indictments that would include others than the four people who were originally charged in this case. Uh, we're looking at the whole incident. I don't want to speculate as to who might be the subject of an indictment. If you do bring uh, federal charges against the officers, do you think it's possible they can get a fair trial? Uh, <clears throat> uh, that, that obviously has to be uh, an area of concern. It certainly uh, concerns me. I think that uh, uh, it uh, is uh, possible that they could get a fair trial. We're, cer we're certainly going to take every uh, step we can uh, to see that they do if we decide to go forward with charges. Uh, obviously, I think the defense will raise this issue uh, and uh, a court will have to make the decision. Uh, would you... In, in the federal, if a federal case does come, would, would you seek a change of venue after what happened uh, in these state cases? Would that bear on your case? And I think it's likely the defense would seek a change in venue. You, you would try to, to, uh, to, to, to try them in Los Angeles if, if that's where I you I don't did. want to speculate about potential tactics in a, in a potential case, uh, but I think that uh, it's likely we would see the defense seek a change in venue. All right, let's take a break right there. We'll come back in a minute after these words.
And we're back with Attorney General William Barr. Mr. Barr, I know your investigators uh, have launched an investigation into what connection the gangs in Los Angeles might have had uh, with, this, uh, with this riot. Uh, what have you found out so far? Well, we are investigating all the violence, the arson uh, that was involved in the riots. Our preliminary uh, information is that there was significant uh, involvement of gang members uh, at the inception of the, uh, the violence, uh, also involvement in the spreading of the violence and the arson. So this would be something that did not necessarily have to do with the Rodney King. It was not a reaction, but, but was a criminal activity. Is, is that what you're saying to me? Yes, I think a lot of the violence and the looting uh, did not have much to do with Rodney King. I think a lot of that kind of activity uh, were uh, uh, the criminal element uh, taking advantage of the situation. Well, well there was a lot of, uh, all kind of stories were going around. One heard things that some of these gangs may have actually had contingency plans, that if, uh, if the, these police officers were found not guilty, that they would use that as an excuse to, to, to break into gun stores, for example. Have you found any, can you tell us anything about that? Or? We've heard that information and we're obviously looking into it, but I couldn't substantiate that right now. What about the guns? There were, what, 3,000 stolen during the riot? Uh, have you recovered any of those yet? Uh, there, there were 1,200 uh, confirmed stolen, pos possibly quite a few more. Uh, we have started recovering some of those firearms, but obviously most of them are still on the street. Let me ask you, there's a, there is a widely held perception among many people in South Los Angeles that, that there's kind of a double standard that the government and that the state uh, has employed in all of this. And one of the things they point to is that you suspended your federal investigation uh, of the police officers uh, the, that, that beat Rodney King while the state took over that case. And yet, when the people were arrested who beat the truck driver in that, that notorious incident that was seen, that, uh, that didn't, you didn't lay back on that. And the, and the charge they make, of course, is that, that you, you want to go as hard as you can against black people, but you're not nearly so interested uh, in, in seeing justice is done in the case when the black man is the victim. How do you respond to those kind of charges? We stand for equal uh, justice and uh, equal application of the law. No one's above the law, uh, and we take each case uh, on its merits. The fact is there are some differences and similarities between those two cases, but in fact, uh, it's going to be handled in generally the same way that we handled uh, the Rodney King case. Uh, we do intend to let the state charges go forward first. Uh, so the state charges against the individuals accused of beating Denny will proceed. We are going to hold our case in abeyance, just as we did with Rodney King. And you'll hold the investigation also? I mean, you... Well, what's different here is that we have a joint task force doing the investigation, so there are state and federal investigators mixed up on a joint task force, and they're all working on the same investigation. That's one of the differences here, and that's just because of the way the investigation was structured. But again, the federal government is going to uh, hold its case in abeyance and let the state proceed, just as we did in Rodney King. Every administration official, Vice President Quayle last week on this broadcast, other officials in, in other venues, always mention law and order. It's the first word uh, that is talked about uh, when, you, when you talk about Los Angeles. Uh, what do you think that the lessons of Los Angeles are, and what are the problems that Los Angeles is exposed to the country? Is it a law and order problem? Is it something that goes beyond that? Uh, it's partly uh, and, and largely a law and order problem, but it does go beyond that too. And I think from a, at least from a law enforcement standpoint, Los Angeles underscores, I think, the message that this administration has been trying to get across on law enforcement. First, uh, that we do have to uphold the, ru the rule of law. Violent crime is a serious problem in our country, uh, and the rule of law is essential uh, to holding our country together. We're a diverse country. The glue that holds us together is the rule of law. Uh, and it's the foundation upon which we hope to build uh, uh, a better society. Second, that law enforcement alone can't handle the problem of crime. And we do have to work with the community. Law enforcement and the community have to work together in a partnership. And where that happens, uh, you see less of the suspicion between the police and the community. And that's the model we've been pushing. Part of that is community policing, which we've been uh, supporting. Uh, and, and third, that tough law enforcement and social programs to ameliorate the conditions that contribute to crime have to go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. We can't 
expect social programs to succeed in the city unless there's some tough law enforcement there because crime is causing poverty these days. It's discouraging investment, discouraging jobs uh, in the inner city. So we, we have to marry these two approaches and that's what the president's Weed and Seed program is about. Well, mentioning Weed and Seed, it's very <coughs> interesting to me because that program does seem to work uh, where you've tried it out in pilot programs. But one part of that program is that local police have to be able to put enough officers into those areas so they can walk the beat and talk to community leaders. Uh, many departments say they can't participate because they just don't have enough officers, that, that uh, they're going to have to have some help to keep the other officers on the beat if they're going to be able to participate in those programs. Uh, can you see a way that the federal government can help them do that beyond what you're already doing? Because without it, many of them say weed and seed just won't be enough. Right. Uh, we are helping now, and in fact, uh, even apart from Weed and Seed, over the past two years, we've supported uh, community policing with grants of $25 million in the 16 Weed and Seed cities we have now. Most of the money that we're putting in is for community policing, and of course, we'll do all we can to continue to support that. But state and local governments should not uh, be scrimping on law enforcement. I think to the extent they undercut law enforcement, they're frustrating all their other programs. And so now's not the time for cutbacks. What, what did you say? I'm sorry. That to they... the extent they scrimp on law enforcement, they're going to undercut their other programs. If you build housing projects only to see them taken over by drug addicts and drug traffickers, you really haven't advanced the ball. So to the extent you want your general uh, efforts at social rehabilitation and urban renewal to take uh, hold, you're going to have to invest in law enforcement. I think that's one of the problems in Los Angeles, and I'm not criticizing the leadership at this uh, point, but there are only 8,000 policemen uh, in the Los Angeles Police Department. That's the smallest police department per capita for any large city, and uh, given the great area they have, stretched very thin. So they, they don't have the capacity to build that kind of relationship with the community that has to be established. One of the things that we find in polling that, that you hear over and over uh, is that the frustration in the country these days that the government simply seems unable to get anything done. Uh, I was thinking about that as I was going back to the clips this week, and I, I was reminded that uh, the Attorney General Thornburg, before you came to the office, immediately after the King incident was reported and people saw the videotape for the first time, ordered this gargantuan study of police brutality. And yet that, that study, it, it's a year later and the study's never been released. Why is that? Well, the study is still underway and, and the initial data from the Civil Rights Division was so spotty and incomplete that we couldn't draw any conclusions from it. And so that was fed over to the National Institute of Justice, which now has two studies that are contracted out and we expect them in the fall. But I'd like to make a broader point to the point but, you just... But let me, let me just, before you make your broader okay. point, let me wait. But doesn't that kind of embarrass you that the government, it takes the government a year to find out if there's police brutality? I mean, and you still haven't gotten it done? I mean, isn't that what frustrates people? They say every time something happens, well, we're going to have a big study, and it goes on for a year, and then nothing ever happens. Well, the study isn't to find out whether there's police brutality. Uh, we know there is police brutality. It's reprehensible. It's still the exception, not the rule. The, the, what the study is trying to do is get at the root causes of, of uh, police brutality and look as to what kinds of factors in a police department, the training, the operations of internal affairs, uh, the screening of police officers, how we can change these things to cut down uh, on, on police brutality. And it doesn't embarrass me that that takes some time to do. It would seem to me you ought to be able to get <coughs> something of a handle on it uh, in a year. Well, uh, the, the data that we have here at the federal level is very incomplete. I mean, it's very hard for us to sort out, for example, which are the valid complaints and which aren't. It doesn't tell you very much to say there's so many complaints per thousand arrests. I think that's one thing we, you and I will just have to disagree on. Mr. Attorney General, thank you very much for coming today. Pleasure to have you. We'll be back in a minute with a roundtable. Continue our discussion of Los Angeles. In Los Angeles, the congresswoman for the area hardest hit, Maxine Waters, congresswoman from South Los Angeles, in Los Angeles today. Political strategist, uh, Republican activist Ed Rollins, and urban economist Jeff Foe. Welcome to all of you. I'd like to begin with you, uh, Ms. Waters. Uh, now that the decision has been made to retry uh, Officer Powell, do you think that's going to uh, level off the situation out there? And what's the mood out in your district today? Well, let me uh, just say that the mood, uh, in my estimation, is not a good one. There's an eerie calm 
But I think bubbling beneath the surface is still a lot of rage, and it worries me. I'm very concerned about it. I think the uh, decision to retry the officer uh, is a good decision, and uh, I'm hopeful that it will send a signal uh, to those who believe there is little or no justice that perhaps we can move forward and do the right thing. But of course, it's going to take a lot more than that. And um, the real question now is whether or not we can get people to believe that there is justice in America for these young black males, uh, mostly, and for black people in general. All right, let's, uh, we'll come back to you in just a moment, uh, Congresswoman. Let me turn to uh, our guests here in the studio. First, uh, an urban economist and an urban expert. Uh, this was the week, uh, Mr. Foe, that, that the White House sort of unveiled its response and told what it intended to, you, to do. Do you think it's going to be enough? No, I think it's just totally inadequate. It's a small drop, <clears throat> excuse me, a small drop in a very, very big bucket. $500 million for a weed and seed program just doesn't scratch the surface uh, for what's needed in terms of crime prevention and social services. This country needs at least, at a minimum, about $50 billion in new public investment in uh, human infrastructure and training and education and uh, infrastructure in the city, and uh, the president's plan doesn't come anywhere near it. All right, well, let's go to Ed Rollins now, and why don't you take it from the political side. Ed, how do you think uh, is uh, the big emphasis, of course, that the administration is making is on law and order. Is this the right way for George Bush to go uh, for the good of the country and for the good of George Bush in a political sense? Obviously, from a, from a political perspective, uh, uh, law and order is very important to the, to the base Republican constituency. But the president is trying to look to a much bigger picture. I mean, he's not doing what's just politically. He's trying to do what's right. I would agree that there's not enough resources, but there's not enough resources in the country to do all we need to do. This is going to take a very long time to solve this problem. And I think the critical thing right now is, is in the two communities, you've got hatred. In, in the black community, in, in, in Mrs. Waters' uh, district, you have despair, and somehow you have to turn it around and create hope. In the white community, the suburbs surrounding her district, uh, you have fear, and somehow you have to eliminate that. And I, and I think the critical thing here is to begin the dialogue and not the quit questioning everybody's motives. We need to work well, together to, to try and resolve this. Let me just um, uh, <clears throat> correct what you just said. Uh, my people and I people who just go out and hate folks, you have a lot of fear in the black community. They fear law enforcement. There is no community policing going on. Uh, they fear those who discriminate against them. Uh, they are more victims than anybody else. So I don't want people to leave with the impression that we've got a lot of people just sitting around hating. I think that from our point of view, it appears that we're hated more than we hate. Well, no matter who, whether, whether, whether uh, the unfortunate thing, Maxine, as you know well, we've got to begin dialogue. There's hatred on both sides, and it's one of the most significant problems facing this country. Well, and we it's need not, a lot it's, more than dialogue. We need some action by government and some leadership by the president. Well, we I, need a president who's going to be serious about doing something about this unrest. Well, one and of the I think he can get support from suburbia. Well, We're all at risk with this kind of madness that's going on. We need a president who's not only going to give leadership, but who's willing to commit some dollars. All of the mayors in this country converged on Washington with a $35 billion plan. Why can he support a real investment in America's cities? Well, Maxine, you know, you, you speak from two sides of the coast. You walk out of a White House meeting that you crashed last week, and you basically say how wonderful the president and the oh, leadership I are I working together. The, N now you're, now you're, out, now the you're out there wonderful. basically trying to raise, trying to raise the rhetoric. I have never called the president wonderful. He is not wonderful. What I said when I walked out of the meeting is, I'm encouraged. I crashed the meeting because I had not been invited, and it was the right thing for me to do. All right, let's, let's uh, let uh, Mr. Fowler talk just a minute. Yeah, I'd like to put this money business in perspective. Uh, $35 billion is not a lot of money to invest in America. And the notion that we don't have the money, that somehow we can't find it, is just not true. We clearly found the money when we had a national pur purpose in the Persian Gulf. We found the money when we had a national purpose in bailing out savings and loans. We didn't wait for some program to be developed that we haven't heard of yet. There are things we can do right now in the inner city that we know how to do. We know how to teach children. We know how to train people. We know how to fix schools where they have leaking roofs. We know how to give textbooks to kids. We know how to build roads and water systems and transit systems. So there's no reason we have to wait. 
And part of the problem that we're facing now is that we've waited 25 years. There hasn't been an urban policy in this country since the late 1960s. You know, one of the things that, uh, as, as I saw the poll yesterday, that showed Ross Perot, a man without a political party, a man that I think it's fair to say most Americans really don't know very much about, is now the favorite of more people than either the President of the United States or the man who appears to be getting the Democratic nomination. It makes me wonder if somehow both of the political parties are missing the message this year. I'd like to ask you first, Ed. Well, there obviously is a failure of both parties to communicate a message. Both parties have tried to be all things to all, all sides. The Democratic Party has tried to represent people like Maxine all the way to the extreme, uh, the extreme right, and our party has done the same. I think the American public today is terribly frustrated with the political process. There's a long ways to go, and the fact that Ross Perot leads today doesn't mean a whole lot, other than the fact there's a lot of Americans today that don't like the two choices that are facing them. And obviously, this kind of a crisis in a political season is probably the worst time to try and find solutions, and I would certainly hope that we can tone down the rhetoric and start trying to find the but solutions. But the, the problem with problems is they always come up at the worst time when, it, sure. when, it, when you have sure. to look for a solution. What needs well, to be done next, we, uh, Ms. Waters? What, what do you think the answer is here? Well, I, I think the problem is for the past 12 years we have seen just a lack of leadership and a lack of attention to the cities. It is not unreasonable to ask the president and the Congress of the United States to invest money in the inner cities. The president made a rather eloquent plea for Russia, and he predicted that they would have riots if they were not fed, if they were not taken care of. I want to see the same kind of leadership for these cities and for America. $35 billion is not a lot of money. We have it by way of the peace dividend. We need to recognize that we can take the savings from the defense budget, we can apply some of that money toward reducing the deficit, but we can take $35 billion of that and invest it in the cities. The president has said he will not do it. He has a phony six-point program. I'm going to try and work with him. Everybody's going to try and work with him. He's promised to veto if we try and do more than he wants, but we've got to organize this country and push the president and the Congress to do the right thing, to simply invest in these inner cities and provide some real opportunities for job training and jobs, ownership, and entrepreneurship. It we, can be done. We have just about 30 seconds left. Let me close with you, Mr. Foe, as kind of a neutral here. Uh, is the money being spent the right way? Is an entirely new approach needed? What would you suggest at this I, point? I think we already know what to do. We'll never have a perfect program, but when we decided to go to the moon, First we made the commitment for 10 years, then we put up the money, and it turned out that a lot of people with good ideas and lots of energy solved that problem. We can do the same thing in the cities of the United States. To all three of you, I want to say thanks. A very Thank interesting you. discussion. We'll be back in a minute. Well, there was a lot of mail this week about last week's interview with Vice President Quayle, and it mirrored the debate going on these days about how to respond to the events in Los Angeles. On the one hand, Albert Rademacher agreed with the Vice President's call for law and order, writing, if the cops can't use all necessary force in L.A., like the Titanic, is America doomed to the depths? But Kevin Park, who used to live in South Central Los Angeles, wrote, why did the SNL crooks go free? Why did Congressman kiting checks go free? Why does a president who orchestrated Watergate go free while 7,500 minorities who riot to bring social and political change go to jail? Well, that's it for this week. Thanks for joining us on Face the Nation.